Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, on behalf of the Tug Hill Commission, Region 6 of the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, and the Hamilton, Herkimer, Jefferson, and Lewis County Soil and Water Conservation Districts, we are so happy you could join us today for this virtual piece of the Black River Watershed Conference titled Early History of the Black River Watershed or A Pathway Through Time. Um, this is the fourth of seven webinars uh, in our virtual Black River Watershed Conference series. And this would have been our keynote event last June. We were really happy to have a two day event and bringing this to you the day before is sort of a, a, a fun and fun and an informative way to, to get to know one another uh, at the day before our conference. Uh, the remaining schedule of webinars is on the commission's website at www.tughill.org. And just some housekeeping items today. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be posted on the commission's website when we're done. Uh, you're all muted, reduce background noise. Um, but please feel free to use the chat button if you wanna ask questions, um, but uh, please be sure to keep your questions and comments uh, related to the subject, the Black River watershed and history. I'd like to say a quick hello to Nichelle Swisher um, and Christine Watkins. They are joining us today. And without further ado, mm -hmm. I'm gonna let um, Dr. Rush and Mr. Peter Hayes say uh, their introductions when they when they begin their their presentations. So, take it away. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Uh, thank you to the commission and the sponsoring organizations. It's a privilege to be joining you for the webinar today. I'm Lori Rush. I'm the archaeologist at Fort Drum, New York. I have the very best job in the United States Army, and it's been. Um, so fortunate for me to have had the opportunity to live in Northern New York uh, since 1983 and to have a chance to experience this region's amazing history. So for my first slide, uh, what I wanted to do is take you very way back in time um, to when the ice sheets were covering Northern New York. So Peter, if you could uh, advance the slides. There we go. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Um, and what I wanted to do was share with you uh, exactly um, the depth of time that we're talking about and take you to the very earliest origins of the Black River. This map is one of very early projectile points. They're called Clovis points, and they're very distinctive because they have a big, deep groove down the middle, which made it very easy to half them to a spear. And I'll be showing you a picture of one here in a couple of moments. But the black dot is us and the fact that we've been fortunate enough to find a Clovis point here on Fort Trump. So we know that the very earliest inhabitants of North, uh, Eastern North America were here and that they were using the Black River watershed as a transportation pathway. And in our next slide, we can look even more closely at a map of the region and it will show you that yes as the ice is melting there's a lot more water in our region and it's interesting because the creation stories of our Haudenosaunee or Iroquoian people even talk about how early on there was so much water everywhere and then um, as a sky woman is uh, coming to the earth the animals have to go and find more land for her so it's interesting to also notice that our Tug Hill is shaped like a turtle and in the creation story the land uh, begins to form on the turtle's back. So we have to wonder if perhaps maybe those ancient people stood on the bluffs of the Black River and as uh, the glacial lakes drained away after the ice dam broke in the St. Lawrence, they would have seen that land emerging and that would definitely have been worth telling their grandchildren this story. You'll see on this map too that I've drawn in a little Black River. I'm showing you the Clovis Point again. And this map was created by colleagues to also show you, if you look closely at the tiny uh, yellow triangles, those are all points where the original stone came from the Hudson Valley, in a place called uh, Normanskill near Fort Ann, New York. And uh, as we see where the points are found, we see again that they're following those watery pathways. Next slide. And as I mentioned, um, here's a picture of the Clovis Point that was found on Fort Drum. You can see uh, the big kind of scoop out of the stone in the middle of it. 
And this is actually what the land would have looked like when the early people were here because the sands of Fort Drum were the ancient beaches along the early uh, form of Lake Ontario. Geologists call it glacial Lake Iroquois. And as the Black River flowed into that lake, it dropped its uh, silt and made these amazing sand plains. Uh, some um, places it's over 100 feet thick. And uh, the early people would have been following the waterways and that is how they ended up here. We actually know this point was made right at this location because sadly uh, for uh, the craftsman, it broke as he was making it and he probably or she discarded it right there in place. Our next slide is a picture of what a fireplace or early hearth would have looked like. And this would be an opportunity to uh, dig a hole in the ground and start a fire. And luckily for us, we have carbon-14 dates that help us um, know exactly or very close to when that fire was lit, uh, in our case, 8,000 years ago. There are actually two uh, subsequent fires at this location 60 years apart, but also 8,000 years ago. So uh, the ancient people have left their traces all throughout our region. And we've been lucky enough to find over 200 of these ancient places on Fort Drum. Next slide. And our uh, team began a study where we mapped uh, pathways across New York because we we're very interested in seeing where those pathways might zero in as the ancient people are coming up the Black River and uh, entering our uh, northern New York, Jefferson County, Lewis County. And so on this map, the blue lines represent waterways and the yellow lines represent land pathways. And you'll see that sometimes the path in the land follows the waterway quite closely. And again, you'll see that, of course, our Black River plays a very prominent role in terms of these crossings of our region. Next slide. And we have proof of uh, the different people who are coming to visit us. So not only do we have the Clovis Point again that came in from the Hudson Valley, so perhaps even traveling a little bit south and then west along the Mohawk and then north, of course, uh, up our Black River. But we also have uh, people coming from Ohio. And so the face here with the ear spool uh, sh is showing you uh, that we have mound building people from the big mounds of the American Midwest, the Mississippian and uh, Hopewell, Adena kingdoms are also venturing into our region. They appear to maybe be fishing people and they uh, are bringing also their pottery technology along. And our pottery, the remains, uh, the bits and pieces uh, that are about 2,000 years old that we find on Fort Drum are very, very similar to the pottery that our colleagues find around the Great Lakes and then further and all the way out to Ohio. We also have stone tools here on Fort Drum that originated in the quarries of uh, the Licking County and the Ohio River Valley. We also have fishermen coming from Pennsylvania. So the two spear points at the bottom of the picture uh, come from stone in Pennsylvania. And those are found in our tiny alluvial floodplain, which is the landform inside the Great Bend of the Black River. So those points are found. And it was a wonderful fishing campsite with scrapers for uh, cleaning fish and more of these spear points. And they are from uh, Pennsylvania. And our other adventures actually appear to come all the way from the very tip of Long Island, Orient Point. And they're distinctive because their spear points, um, are the tail of their spear points is in the shape of a fish tail. And so we call these Orient fish tails. And our colleagues find them also along the Mohawk. And we think we're the northernmost uh, place that they came. And we actually found these points at Indian Lake. But the best way to get from Long Island to Indian Lake, of course, is via the Black River. And the hearth where they cooked those fish dates to 3,500 years ago. Next slide. And during our early days of European adventurism in our region, the Black River continues 
to be very, very important. Some of our earliest evidence of Europeans are from our Jesuits, the black robed uh, people who were coming in along the St. Lawrence and they were trying to encourage our indigenous people to come to religious services and they would often offer uh, uh, prizes or gifts if you came to church, including Jesuit rings. They also brought beads, they brought weapons. And here on Fort Drum, we actually have a site where we found Jesuit rings, uh, Italian beads brought by the French and a French gunflint. And that site dates to 1670. It's just a bit east of the Black River uh, and uh, the influence there, of course, is coming in from the north. Uh, we also find additional French influence dating to the French and Indian War. And in this case, uh, fortunately for historians, General Jolari uh, actually documented his path from Montreal on his way south to blow up Fort Bull uh, in the Mohawk Valley and he had the courtesy of mapping his campsites. And so we're able to follow the path from Montreal, the entrance of the French into the Oswegatchie and their trip down the Black River. Uh, so they camped inside the little bend of the Indian River in Evans Mills, and they camped at Deer River. They camped in between somewhere on Fort Drum, and there he did let us down because he didn't show us exactly where on the fort uh, was the camp. But imagine 200 French soldiers heading south, and once uh, they crossed the portage between Evans Mills and Great Bend, they headed straight uh, south using the Black River, um, which actually made that access to the fort quite vulnerable. And uh, there's a picture, and I'll show you a closer picture of what uh, those French bateaux would look like. Interestingly enough, when the early farming settlers came to Jefferson County in the late uh, uh, 18th, early 19th centuries, they actually found some leftover bateaux in the village of Threeset, the base of the falls. So imagine their surprise when they realized that they were not the first Europeans to have come to our neighborhood. And uh, the last group that I wanted to mention is our Revolutionary War adversaries. So the British created a fort in the Thousand Islands. It was on Carlton Island, which is a large island in the Thousand Islands chain just outside of Cape Vincent, New York. And it's Haldeman, uh, Fort Haldeman, where the raiding parties are organized with the British and their indigenous allies. And they cross over uh, at uh, Millens Bay. They head south on what we call the Sand uh, Bay Road, but eventually they too connect with the Black River and head south for many of the horrific raiding parties and massacres uh, that we know about uh, in the uh, Cherry Valley and the Mohawk. And in fact, some of their captives were brought back using the same pathway. And actually some of the children who uh, were captured were uh, adopted by families in Kingston. Next slide. And this is what one of those bateaux would look like. This one sank in the St. Lawrence and is on exhibit in Mallory Town, uh, where it can be seen today once the Canadian border opens for us once again. And uh, actually, if we could go back for just a moment, uh, Peter, I wanted to also point out um, in the map that you can also see that the early Europeans are connecting with our Haudenosaunee um, uh, nations. And the Black River especially connects uh, directly with the Oneida Indian Nation and the Onondaga Nation. Okay. And now we'll move, I will show you the uh, portage because I guess, and there's the bateau. And I wanted to show you this 1822 map. Um, and again, to uh, sort of lock into place the critical role of the waterways. And you can see that the Indian portage is mapped very clearly on this early map of the region, connecting Great Bend, New York with Evans Mills, New York. But what this connection symbolizes is that connection of the Black River south to the Mohawk, east to the Hudson and the eastern seaboard, and Black River north to the Indian River and north to the St. Lawrence and uh, the Maritimes and the Great Lakes. And with that, I will turn it over to Peter. 
Thank you, Jennifer, and the Tug Hill Commission for providing us with the opportunity to share and hopefully illuminate some of the early history of the Black River Valley. Also, thank you, Dr. Rush, for starting us out by talking about the native inhabitants of the region. I am Peter Hayes, the curator of Constable Hall, and will be picking up the story on how the land transitioned into private ownership and who is involved in that process. I hope you'll be surprised how the story will take us at times quite far from Tug Hill. National and international events have affected our little corner of the world right from the beginning and have added a unique flavor to our first 100 years. This part of the presentation will focus on those I call the purchasers. Uh, the purchasers were the first people to privately own the land. You, you can think of them as the land wholesalers. The developers will come next. The developers sold the land directly to the far individual farmers, but they are also involved in improving the infrastructure and services. The first generation of farmers usually came from New England, and they were the ones who first began to clear the trees and set up the farms. After taking our look at the purchasers, we will then look at three specific examples of developers. That'll be the Larrays of the Larray Mansion, the Pierponts of the Pierpont Manor, and the Constables of Constable Hall. All three of those family buildings still exist. I'll be including some pop-up questions during the talk as I go, so, and so please do interact with the, with the presentation. We're going to start out with uh, just a quick political and economic background of what was going on at this time. Uh, the hostilities between the United States and England ended in 1781 at the Battle of uh, Yorktown, but it was a very uneasy peace for a couple of years. Uh, the Treaty of Paris, which actually recognized the United States, uh, didn't take place for two more years. And even when it did, it did not address many significant issues, including some boundaries um, and uh, what to do about the Native Americans that were on the edge of, the, um, of our, our territories. Also, I'd like to emphasize how much turmoil there was at the time. Uh, there was no federal currency. There was no banking system. Uh, even the government was in confusion. Uh, the the uh, uh, Constitution was still several years away. So there was a confusion. Who was uh, really in charge to negotiate some of, these, um, uh, some of these issues? Was it state level or was it the Continental Congress? New York State had some particular concerns. Uh, they had economic woes. Uh, New York City was uh, devastated by the war. The economy was in difficult shape. And it's also important to remember that each state was responsible for its own debt from the war. There was no such thing as a national debt. It was a state debt. So the state was looking to raise money and it was desperate to do so. Uh, the, the England uh, or the British still occupied uh, forts on the edge of New York. There was a lot of concern um, by New York that the hostilities would resume along the borderline. So there was an interest in securing our border as quickly as possible. And it's also important to recognize that land claims uh, were still very unclear uh, in Western New York. Uh, the area over here where we think of Rochester and Buffalo was claimed by Massachusetts and their claim was actually a very solid claim. So it was in the interest in the, in the New Yorkers to uh, gobble that land up as quickly as possible and make it New York or somebody else would. The area, what we would call the North Country, was uh, still pretty much up for grabs. The, uh, shortly after the Treaty of Paris, uh, there was a Treaty of Fort Stanwix, uh, Fort Stanwix being located at uh, current day Rome, New York. Uh, and that was between uh, mostly New York uh, representatives, some federal representatives, and representatives from the five or the six nations. Uh, the Iroquois nations, um, and I'll call the Haudenosaunee, were present. Uh, of those six nations, four had sided with England during the Revolutionary War, but the Oneidas and Tuscarora sided with the Americans. So this treaty, the 1784 one, uh, really was uh, to settle the land claims with respect to the four nations that sided with England. They, and they were treated as defeated nations at that treaty. Uh, the Oneidas and the Tuscaroras being on the American side, uh, for the time being there said, well, you're okay where you are. Uh, so that was the 1784. Things would change here shortly. 
But uh, as of the important Treaty of Fort Stanwix, there's where things settled. But what the treaty did do is it kicked off a tremendous uh, land speculation fever in Western New York. Um, that was really one of the major effects of, of that treaty. Now our, our Oneida neighbors, uh, as I just said, they were our allies during the revolution. They fought on our side during the um, uh, Battle of Oriskany, Battle of Barren Hill. Uh, this bronze statue in the foreground is uh, Polly Cooper. She took corn down to George Washington's troops at Valley Forge. So uh, in particular, the, fed the federal government and George Washington was very fond of the United States and recognized their contribution. However, there were pressures from many sources to reduce their land holdings. The, uh, the Oneidas were under uh, great pressure at that time from uh, their uh, their holdings had been devastate, physically devastated. They were pushed off of their land uh, back towards Albany. Uh, their relationship with the other uh, six nations were not good because they fought on different sides. Uh, there were probably about 1,000 Oneidas, men, women, and children, occupying about 6 million acres. So there was tremendous pressure uh, to take advantage of their weakness. New York in particular was eyeing their lands for the reasons that I just mentioned. They were looking at uh, raising revenue and what faster way can you do that than sell some land. Okay, we have a pop-up question. Uh, how close did George Washington ever get to Tug Hill? Did he ever sleep there? Now this is actually a fairly difficult question, so I'm not expecting anybody to get it. So after pondering that a moment, I will give you the answer. He did actually uh, on tour, he stopped at uh, Fort Stanwix or Fort Schuyler um, in July of 1783. There's not a whole lot north of uh, Fort Stanwix, so we really don't expect him to uh, sleep anywhere up here. Now, uh, back to New York. The governor of New York, uh, George Clinton, was a man, formidable man of sharp elbows. And he, had, he was looking at all of the uh, issues that uh, I just mentioned that New York was faced, and one of the things he did was set up a land commission. Uh, he, his attorney general, Aaron Burr, was in charge of that land commission, and they pushed very hard to sell that land in New York, to solidify the, the New York's claim to that land. There was an early sale up uh, on the St. Lawrence River set in 1787, but, but the big one, the one that really, the one that really uh, drives this discussion, was the one called Macomb's Purchase, and that took place in 1791. There was a order of corruption around Macomb's Purchase. Uh, it was so large, there were, uh, uh, the opposing political party accused Clinton of getting a kickback. So the wholesale uh, did uh, mire down into investigation for many months before it went through. Um, but let's take a look at who was involved in Macomb's Purchase. Uh, the headline act is, Alexander Macomb. But it actually was a, a deal with three partners, and they're listed here, Alexander Macomb, Daniel McCormick, and William Constable Sr. Uh, they were very good friends. They lived within one block of each other in uh, New York City. They were all Irish. They all were uh, in the officers, actually, of the uh, Friendly Society of St. Patrick's in New York City. So it's natural that they, they were all rich men. So they, it was natural that they would have uh, pooled their resources and made a bid on this uh, very large land sale that was coming up. And indeed, they were the only bidders. Uh, and they obtained, uh, uh, it was, the bid was accepted in 1791. However, Alexander Macomb was somewhat of a um, wild guy. And he continued speculating in banking and then went bankrupt within a few months of having their bid accept, accepted. So he passed out of the scene fairly quickly. He, he uh, ended up unloading his share of McCombs purchase to the other two, McCormick and Constable. Daniel McCormick, uh, the gentleman in the lower left, was uh, the older man. He was the more conservative one. He really did not uh, pursue developing uh, in the North Country. So he's, you can say he stayed in the background. He really is not a, a large part of this story. However, uh, William Constable Sr., he was the young one. He was the elegant one. He was the sophisticated one. He stepped forward to, to make this uh, uh, land deal go through. Now, what was Macomb's purchase? Here you'll see it marked in red. 
uh, with uh, Lake Ontario on the west and St. Lawrence on the uh, north. And it's, the outline is marked, uh, as I said, into red. It is, uh, was divided into six tracks. Uh, number one is uh, in the northeast and then number two, number three, uh, two uh, number three, four, five, and six. Now, the way it worked out is that Constable uh, obtained title to four, five, and six, which just happens to be our Black River Valley. So we're going to focus on uh, the development of tracks four, five, and six. Um, the, their, the setup of when they uh, uh, purchased the land was that they had to pay one sixth every year for six years. So every year they had to come up with one sixth of the purchase price. The total acreage was about 4 million acres. The price was about was six pence of New York money. Uh, New York, we did not have a decimal federal currency yet, so we were using New York money system. So that's uh, pounds, shillings, and pence. So six pence, by my reckoning, is about uh, 17 cents federal money uh, that would be uh, put into effect very shortly. And that's about the correct value for land like this. Sometimes it's uh, said that Macomb's purchase was a, a, a real a steal of, a, of, a, of the land, but it's pretty close to what land was going for out west. But I think an important thing to note was that there was no survey done at the time of the sale. Uh, the, uh, the, they knew where the land was. It was somewhere between this St. Lawrence and somewhere uh, by Lake Ontario, but they didn't really know uh, what was inside. And so the surveyor was, the survey had to be done by the purchaser. So the purchaser bought the land and had to go from there. So what do you think? Was it a smart idea to start selling land before you had a survey? Well, I think your initial reaction would probably be no. <laughs> Okay, uh, that said, how do you expect to come up with the money for the next payment? Uh, there were no, uh, I see your hand there, Charlie. Did you have, uh, uh, I don't know if you had an, a more question, but you have to consider the, the, the conditions. Uh, there were no banks. You could not go uh, borrow the money from anybody. There literally were no banks yet. Um, and you had already tapped out your capital. And uh, what were you going to do? The only way you'd come up with money to make the next payment was to get out there and sell, sell, sell. So that's kind of what happened. Now I'm going to uh, turn to William Constable Sr. because he is the common denominator uh, to the North Country. Uh, virtually everywhere you look, you will find some connection to him. He knew everybody. He had the deal. He had the um, the influence. He he had the connection. It really all goes through William Constable Sr. Even though somewhat ironically, he never visited the North Country. He got as close as yes, Fort Stanwix. Uh, he intended to visit, but he never did. He was an Irishman. He was born in Dublin. As a young man before the Revolutionary War, he was a fur trader, and that's actually where he met Macomb out at Fort Detroit. Uh, trading furs. It's also where he uh, established his relationship with the um, with the native peoples between uh, New York out, out to Detroit. And uh, indeed, he even served briefly during the Revolutionary War. Uh, after the war, he set himself up in New York City and established a trading company uh, with the capital that he had accumulated from his fur trade. And he was one of the one of the men who opened up uh, trading between the United States and China. Uh, in particular, 1784, they, he established um, a fairly regular trading system between uh, New York City and Canton, China. And he made his money off of tea. Uh, tea was what the ships brought back from China and sold for a pretty good price in New York City. So uh, you, can, you can somewhat literally say the, uh, the North Country was bought by the money uh, obtained from tea. Here's another question. Uh, you don't send those ships to China empty, so he had to send something to, to China. Uh, what do you think he sent? He could have sent uh, any number of things. So let's see if anybody's got a guess. Okay, maple sugar, would uh, that was in production, but probably not in the volume that was necessary. So A is not right. And I see a couple of Cs. Yes, uh, uh, ginseng was what he sent over to China. 
And he sent 30 tons of it in one ship. Uh, does everybody know what ginseng is and why it would have been so popular with the Chinese? Well, I'll give you the, uh, I'll give you the, uh, the answer to that one. It's a, an aphrodisiac. Yes, that always sells well in any, in any economy at any time. All right, so William was into shipping, but it was a very difficult uh, business, a very risky. You sent these ships off and they might come back after two years or they might not. It, so he, he really looked to diversify his um, uh, financial position. So he turned to land speculation along with many, many other people. And that's what really, you know, I'm sure they were sitting down at the, uh, at the Irish Center uh, drinking Irish whiskey with his buddies and they decided to put the bid in for Macomb's purchase. It probably happened something like that. So they, they got the bid in, uh, and, but they needed to sell. As I already mentioned, they needed to sell immediately, more land. So uh, within a very short period of time, uh, William packed his bags and he went to Europe. He was the sophisticated European, and he was the perfect one to go there and to see, see what he could sell. He had a, already from his shipping, uh, shipping business, he had connections all over the world. So he immediately went to London and to Paris. Those were the two cities where he really set up shop to sell land. Unfortunately, he, um, he, France was in the middle of the French Revolution. Uh, the Bastille was 1789 and Paris was roiled by revolution for many years. So that was the uh, environment that he ended up being in the middle, going, uh, ended up being in the middle of. Now, any good businessman uh, taps their contacts. So one of the contacts he tapped was Major General Lafayette. Uh, Lafayette was the Major General uh, to George Washington, and that's actually the man that William Constable worked for when he was in the Army. He was his aide. So Lafayette at this time was in Paris, involved in the revolution, and also James Leray de Chamont was in Paris at this time. And William Constable and Leray met each other in New York a couple years before this time. And so these were both men that uh, William Constable knew very well. They were very good friends, lifelong friends actually. So Constable went over and uh, talked to these, uh, to these men and said, uh, I've got this land for sale. And Chamont said, well, we have a revolution going on over here. Uh, the aristocracy is afraid they're going to lose their land or lose their heads or something. I bet you can sell to them. So uh, Leray's brother-in-law uh, contracted with a constable for 600,000 acres, uh, a nice chunk of land. And uh, so what a great deal. And that was in 1792, uh, shortly after William got to Europe. However, William had also set up other land agents working back in New York State, just to note that. We'll see how that plays out here in a couple slides. Well, poor William had business reverses due to his uh, brother, and he died an early death. So he faded from the scene at this point. But uh, the important thing that came was that there hadn't been any survey the 1792 deal with the French people for 600,000 acres for, was for land north of Black River. Uh, they set up uh, the Company of New York or Ca the Castor Land Company to come over here at that point, 1792. Uh, William Constable apparently used this map, the, the Southier map, that uh, does not have Black River on it. So even though that was part of the deal that the land was north of Black River, it was not on that map. So apparently, William Constable drew it on there, and he drew it on there wrong. He drew it as an east-west river rather than the L-shaped river that it really is. Um, so this caused a lot of problems. Uh, here is the, the next map I'm showing is from 1799, this, the well-respected Satzman lap, map. This is a map that we have over at Constable Hall. It's actually a German map. This is in 1799, and, and you'll, I highlighted uh, a rectangle on the left, which is part of New York blew it up to show it on the right. And you can see the dashed line, which I think is my interpretation of what the French thought they were buying with their 600,000 acres. Uh, they were expecting to put a city on the, on the mouth of Black River, and they were planning to build another city upriver on Black River to um, you know, gather the, the, re the farming produce and send it down the river and then ship it off their port city. 
they were so they were expecting a, a fairly large uh, shoreline or uh, shoreline on the lake. Now this is 1799. Well, there were people going up Black River uh, by 1793, 94, 95. Constableville was settled in 96, so there were people on the ground that knew this was wrong right away, and started to yell at Constable, who was in um, Paris at the time. So that's a pretty slow letter. To, <laughs> you could not send them an email. So there, months would go by be trying to straighten this mess out. And uh, I mean, look at this map. Uh, where's Black River on this map? I can't find it. And none of those rivers really make sense. Uh, so the people on the ground knew there was a problem. Uh, but there were in Europe, they still were very confused what was going on. It wasn't until the Broadhead survey, and Broadhead was out there tramping through the woods and the wilderness trying to get a proper survey. It's a very difficult uh, enterprise. It took years to get a survey. Uh, this one was published, we're not sure exactly when, around eight, 1800, although he, he probably had most of the data by a couple of years before that. Now, this, this was the problem. The French were sold the land south of that red line in north of Black River. So now when Black River is shown in its correct position, the only land that the French really had was this little sliver of land here, and then it was separated in another triangle over here, it, instead of the rectangle they were expecting. All right, well, Constable couldn't just round off the rectangle and sell it because the blue arrow points at the uh, Boylston track, that had already been sold to other people. So there was, there was no easy way out of this mess. And so this, this uh, issue went on for years. Uh, ultimately, the French company had to uh, reduce their holdings from 600,000 to 200,000 acres. And it was one of the contributing reasons they, they, the company failed. Uh, so that failed. And the, the, remember, the man who set up that was a man called Chazani. It went back to Leray. Leray had, uh, he was the brother-in-law. He was the one that Constable really knew. So Leray oh. stepped in at that point and Leray uh, picked up the land and started to add to it. And so as we start to turn to the Leray family, uh, I'm gonna turn the presentation back over to uh, Dr. Rush, who's gonna talk about uh, the Leray's. He picked up this land, the, the red arrows are pointing at, and added to the land up here in what would be the great tract number four. Peter, before you change slides, oh, can you go back to that slide? There's a question in the chat. What is the other blue square in northern Jefferson County? Oh, ho, ho. This is a, the whole, the whole story is exceed, exceedingly complex. So this, what you're getting is a simplified version. Uh, the blue square is uh, Pierre Penet Square. And uh, that is a whole nother story. There is a wonderful book on uh, Penet Square that one should read to really understand that. In two or three sentences, there was an adventurer, a French adventurer called Pierre Penet, came to this country and negotiated directly with the Oneidas, uh, contravening all laws at the time. And the Oneidas thought he was going to help them. And they, they provided him with that square of land. I believe it's 10 by 10 square miles. Uh, he, uh, being an adventurer, uh, somehow disappeared in the, uh, the West Indies, and the title of that land became confused for decades afterwards as trying to straighten that out. It was picked up by Lafarge later, a very complex story, very interesting, uh, but a little too complicated for, uh, for, and I don't know all of the nuances of that for me to go into here, but it's Panay Square. Um, Peter, uh, would they'd like to know if you can provide the, um, the name and the, uh, uh, the name and the author of that book. Oh, I, there, there it is. Charles uh, replied for you. Uh, Penny Square History by Thomas Powell. Yep, that's right. Okay. Powell. Fantastic. Yes. Thank you. Very worthwhile read. Okay, uh, uh, Dr. Rush, you can take it away. Part three. All right. Um, thank you, uh, and uh, for that um, seamless introduction to James Luray uh, de Chameau. And so you can uh, see on the slide, there's a picture of Luray Mansion and also the portrait of James with his hunting dog and uh, uh, 
and gun. And we were joking during our rehearsal that James does not illustrate a good example of gun safety. The next slide is an image of uh, two medallions. We see uh, on the left Jacques uh, Donatien Leray de Chameau. This is the father of James. And on the right, we see Benjamin Franklin. And these illustrations show us the relationship between the Leray family and our founding fathers in terms of the American Revolution. What happened is that uh, the Jacques Donatien Leray de Chameau played a key role in negotiating the French alliance with the Americans and actually hosted John Adams and Benjamin Franklin and other members of our early government in France when uh, they went abroad to seek assistance in fighting the British. Jacques actually uh, loaned, uh, but it ended up being a donation, ships and men to the revolution and invested the greater part of the Leray family fortune into uh, what became this successful battle against the English. They also invested in continental dollars and what uh, then became a, a serious problem for the family is that the Continental Congress went bankrupt and of course Peter has alluded to the chaos during this time period and the uh, family essentially was in, in difficult shape financially. Jacques sent James uh, to the U.S. to address the Continental Congress about the issue. And although everyone agreed and was appreciative of their assistance, there just was no money to pay them back. So as James was here visiting, he met an American and fell in love. Her name was uh, Grace Cox. He uh, gained American citizenship and he uh, came upon the idea of investing in land as a way of rebuilding the family fortune. So he took the funds that he uh, remained and then uh, went into business with his brother-in-law, uh, a gentleman named Chisanis, and also uh, with, with William Constable. And they formed a land company and uh, became very interested in the new lands of New York State. And we can go to the uh, DeWitt map dating to 1804. On this map, it does show uh, the Black River uh, does appear. And James uh, sent his uh, family physician, a Dr. Baudrey, who is also uh, working as an agent on his behalf, to the region and uh, with the goal of asking uh, what uh, of discovering where in the land would be the very best place for his own personal estate. And Dr. Baudrey discovered uh, this lovely plateau. In fact, um, I'm broadcasting to you from uh, the Luray estate. And uh, it's a lovely piece of land just above the Pleasant Creek, which is a tributary of the Indian River. And there was a very small mill seat. The area had been settled by Benjamin Brown, a brother of General Jacob Brown. And he had a tiny place called Brown's Mills. So there was a little bit of infrastructure. And so James, although he did change the name of Brown's Mills to Raysville when he arrived, uh, did select this place for construction of his first mansion and to set aside as uh, a 200 acre estate. So uh, as uh, we have a look um, at the next slide, which is an historic image of what we call the park and the farm, what James did is he divided the estate essentially into two parts. And one part was the very formal portion of the estate and he built his first mansion, we think on the edge uh, of the plateau where he had a lovely view of the mill seat and where he could watch uh, his neighbors at work. And uh, the second part of the estate was his investment in his personal farm. And Leray was quite visionary in terms of wanting his immigrants to be successful in the new land. And as a result, uh, he wanted his farm to be a model farm. And he was also willing to experiment. Um, as you can imagine, it was a bad surprise uh, for many of the early immigrants to discover that even though we might be at the a similar latitude, 
uh, to France, we definitely do not have the same weather. And as a result, it was more challenging. And maybe some of the methods the French farmers were used to using uh, at home, would it would be a little bit cold uh, here. James experimented with mulberries and silkworms. He thought maybe he could establish a silkworm industry, but uh, alas, uh, they probably froze. He did have a greenhouse and he was very proud of being able to grow citrus in our climate. And in fact, that was a kind of a, a status thing with the founding fathers. We have correspondence uh, between Larray and some of um, our uh, well-known people like Thomas Jefferson and, and John Adams. And one of the correspondence uh, letters refers to uh, their different attempts to grow citrus in, in extreme climates. In any case, uh, one of the most important accomplishments at this time was uh, the establishment of the Northern New York Agricultural Society. And the, uh, uh, it's the founder of our Jefferson County Fair. We have the longest running county fair in the United States as a result of James LeRae offering this opportunity for people to share their agricultural success stories. We uh, also um, have an image of uh, the park and the farm. Um, as uh, we see it today, uh, the Army uh, acquired the land in 1940, and, um, uh, and so the big barns and so on are gone. But um, the, uh, uh, fortunately, the mansion and some of the outbuildings still remain. So Sally Peter, my computer has decided not to show me your screen anymore. So um, can you tell me which slide we're on? We, we're on uh, the park and farm, uh, the modern picture. Okay, great. So now we'll move um, to a, a sketch of the very first mansion, um, which is a sketch we think that was done by Hippolyte de Govello. And uh, he was Lorraine's son-in-law. He was married to Lorraine's daughter, Therese. And that mansion burned, at least in part, in 1820, was rebuilt on the same site. But by 1826, James's son, Vincent, really felt that that mansion wasn't good enough to uh, really impress people they were trying to sell land to. So the current mansion, uh, here on Fort Drum was built brand new in 1826. Uh, the next slide is the family entrance to the current mansion. So the estate had two entrances. One uh, required the visitors to uh, go through the village of Larraysville, uh, cross uh, the dam at the mill seat and then come up uh, the hill. So we joke that we have two front doors at Luray Mansion um, and it would have had a big curving entrance uh, with a stagecoach uh, step. And then this is the family entrance. And uh, so they would have come uh, to the part of the mansion with a beautiful porch with the columns. James's daughter, Therese, started her family here, but sadly the baby passed away in uh, after only uh, 15 months, and she's buried next to the family entrance with a silver bell that the family rang whenever they came or left uh, to uh, remind her that, how much they missed her. We even have a letter from Larray to John Adams talking about the tremendous grief that all experienced with the loss of the child. Therese's descendants uh, still uh, name uh, their daughters Clotilde in every generation. There has been uh, a daughter with the same name uh, since that loss. And the family has actually been back to visit uh, her grave. Um, we also have a view in the next slide of some of the ponds and pathways. The idea of having a park and a farm is the idea of formal gardens, nice places where the ladies uh, can maybe walk through the forest pathways. We suspect there was a little bridge uh, to an island in one of the reflecting pools with perhaps a gazebo. And we have uh, wonderful dreams and plans about maybe being able to recreate uh, some of that wonderful landscape experience. Um, the next slide illustrates some aspects of uh, French life uh, here on the Larray estate. Um, we've done some archaeology here. They seem to have eaten their share of seafood. I'm, I was really uh, surprised and taken aback 
um, by the amount of oyster shells in one of the uh, middens or uh, dumps. And I have to wonder about how you get seafood safely here. Hopefully they were transporting it maybe in the winter time uh, so that folks weren't, weren't dying of food poisoning. There's a correspondence where Thomas Jefferson talks about how envious he is of Loray's French table. And in fact, Jefferson sent um, servants to France to learn uh, French cooking uh, so that he would have that same uh, privilege. We see a teapot. Therese brought 50 place settings of fine French porcelain with her um, because it was her plan to be her father's hostess here in the frontier. Her mother, Grace, was quite ill. We don't know if Grace ever even maybe had an opportunity to come all the way to the estate. We know she enjoyed Boston Spa and some of the other uh, wonderful activities that New York had to offer. But Therese and uh, Hippolyte are the ones that come uh, with James and are running the household for a while. You can see uh, fine French clocks. And also I'd like to point out the La Nuit table, which now is in a collection at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. And uh, there's even a special video. They were so excited to get it in their collection. Our next slide is of the uh, slave quarters. Uh, I tragically looking back, uh, some of the Larray family fortune was made in the slave trade. And in fact, when uh, Larray came and established his household here in Northern New York, he uh, brought slaves with him. I suspect that much of the land here was cleared um, using the labor of enslaved people. And we know that the head of the household, household was a very beloved enslaved woman named Rachel. And Rachel decided who and who would not uh, have an opportunity to meet with James LeRae. It sounds like she ran uh, something of a quite a tight ship. Um, and uh, she was beloved by the children. And in fact, when she passed away, they commissioned a headstone where they referred to her um, as their mother. And so we know that those relationships are close and complex. We do have standing slave quarters uh, here on the estate. And we are also beginning now in terms of our interpretive efforts here at the Ray Mansion to tell the story of all of the inhabitants of the household, um, including the enslaved household members. Actually, when this house was built, uh, 1826, is uh, at the same time that slaves are finally uh, completely emancipated in the state of New York. And the story is that James called uh, his staff together and offered them the opportunity to stay for wages or begin new lives. And the story is that they all chose to stay for wages. Uh, the next um, image is, uh, again, another look at the farm. And in the 1980s, when Fort Drum expanded, we had archaeology colleagues that did extensive excavations. So we actually see one of the original barn foundations. The farm manager and his wife were indentured servants. So they came uh, with Ray in exchange. Uh, they worked for him for seven years in exchange for their passage here. Um, we have some wonderful local histories of Luray, uh, the estate running cattle uh, down uh, toward Theresa along the Indian River. And he also had a prize winning herd of Merino sheep. He was interested in growing hemp and also very interested in sugaring. We've uh, learned from the descendants of the managers of Luray Sugarbush that they tapped at least a thousand trees here in the winter time. And our next slide is of um, the land office. Fort Drum is currently restoring the building. You can see in the historic photo, a picture of the land office with its proper peaked roof. Um, and then you can see it's, uh, it, it's actually, um, this is a past photo because the inappropriate shed roof is gone and we're in the re process of repointing the stone walls and putting the proper roof back on. But we think that uh, this is the building where, where some of the real estate transactions actually took place uh, between Larray and his farming uh, immigrant customers. And we have a, a picture of his, his signature there. Our next slide is an historic photo of the mansion. And, uh, and then we have a second historic photo of the mansion. And uh, 
sadly, you can begin to see that uh, the mansion uh, does uh, see some tough times in the early 20th century. James uh, went back to France in 1836, uh, and Vincent sold the estate to a French chemist named Jules Payen. Uh, and so the, a wealthy French family did move in after the Lorrays left. And then Jules uh, Payen's daughter, uh, Julia, married a local gentleman, William Phelps, and the descendants of their family stayed here at the estate until uh, the 1930s when it was purchased by Colonel uh, retired Harold Remington and his wife, and they invested a tremendous amount of uh, money and love into restoring the house. And then sadly for them, it really had to have been heartbreaking in 1940, Luray, the Luray estate became part of the eminent domain as the army expanded Fort Drum. And so uh, the Luray Mansion has been in army hands ever since. And my final slide is of the Luray Mansion today. And uh, we ha have moved in the cultural resources and natural resources programs uh, now occupy the historic district. And so the mansion has resumed, is uh, resuming its original uh, mission, which is uh, outreach to the community. And of course, Luray's plan was to use this house uh, for social events, to convey a sense of prosperity and a bright future. And we're really pleased. And when the virus is over, we're looking forward to welcoming all of you back uh, for historic house tours, for events. And you can see, um, even with the other virus, we will be decorating for Christmas. Uh, traditionally, uh, the mansion is uh, a, a very important part of Fort Drum's holiday season and in normal times would also be where the commanding general of the 10th Mountain Division hosts his uh, Christmas reception for the community. So um, with that, uh, thank you again for the opportunity to participate. And we hope that all of you will have a chance to come and see us here at Fort Drum in a healthier future. So back to you, Peter. And please, if anyone has any questions, I would be delighted to uh, uh, answer. Well, if any uh, questions drift in here, I will, I will stop uh, in the chat window. Uh, I will stop uh, and let you address those. I don't see any right at the moment, so I'm going to uh, continue plugging along here. And, um, but thank you for that presentation, uh, uh, Dr. Luray. I think uh, I had my, had my first vision, visit up to the mansion just a couple of years ago and was, was uh, very surprised and pleased. Uh, I'm going to add two more families that are instrumental in the development of the region. There were actually many. We, we were just picking these three as examples to give you a feel for what was going on. And uh, just consider, you know, what the role of a developer is. Uh, the, the, to develop, you, you owned the land, but you had to get money off of it, and you probably were short of money. Everybody, everybody was short of cash. Um, the... Uh, but the developers, first thing they had to do was bring to find the people. They had to find people to come. There was tremendous competition, uh, particularly out west. The, the western states and western New York were developing very rapidly at this time. So there was a competition. So you first had to find and, and entice people to come. Once they came, you had to uh, sell them land. They had, since nobody had money, you had to sell them mortgages. Once you, they were on the land, then you had to collect payments for them from them. Uh, they might not have had money, so you may have taken it in goods and uh, services. And you probably had to foreclose occasionally. Uh, but that was only part of their role. As a developer, you, you had to improve the land or you would, nobody, it, it, the value of your land wouldn't be nearly as great. So that first decade or so, you really focused on roads. You had to get a sawmill in place. You had to get a grist mill to grind the grain. And then shortly thereafter, you needed uh, uh, churches, schools, etc., or or you would not have been attractive. So it was a it was a um, a challenge to be a developer. You weren't just sitting there collecting money uh, easily. So I'm going to uh, 
touch on two more families. The first family I'm going to touch on are the Pierponts. Uh, the Pierpont is, a, is an old New England family. Uh, 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 James Pierpont was one of the founders of Yale College. Uh, 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 Aaron Burr is tied with the family. Uh, J.P. Morgan, uh, the rich banker, the P stands for Pierpont. So they're, they're a very well-known uh, New England family. But this, this gentleman right here is Hezekiah Beers Pierpont. He left New England. Um, as a very young man, a teenager, and came to New York City to make his fortune. He was uh, ambitious. Uh, he did very much like William Constable. He got into shipping uh, to make his, uh, his money. He was uh, on a ship uh, coming back from uh, China when it was captured by pirates and impounded and everything became complicated. And he ended up being in Paris uh, while William Constable was in Paris, and that's how they met. So that's, they did, even though they were both from New York City, they actually met in Paris, and that's where the connection between the Constables and Pierponts started. Uh, he eventually married the eldest child of, uh, of William and a Constable uh, when they got back to New York City. After he concluded his uh, business in Paris, uh, which was, as I might want to point out again, during the French Revolution, he came back to New York City, and uh, at that point, he got out of shipping and he got into land development, but actually in Brooklyn. He bought uh, a good section of Brooklyn Heights when it was still farmland. Uh, you can think of the modern day Brooklyn Bridge uh, going from Manhattan over to Brooklyn. And his land was right on the Brooklyn side of uh, the Brooklyn Bridge. Now the bridge wasn't put into much later and actually uh, Hezekiah and his family operated the Brooklyn Ferry right at that position for many decades. Now Anna Constable Pierpont, she was the daughter, uh, the oldest child of William Constable Sr. Uh, she was uh, beautiful and intelligent uh, and uh, somewhat like her father, she lit uh, a pretty bright light wherever she went. Um, I have a little quote from a newspaper. At the beginning of the century, that would be 1800, Brooklyn captured from New York the daughter of a wealthy merchant, one of the most beautiful belles of the metropolis. She had been conspicuous in the society of the Van Rensselaers, the Stuyvesants, the Roosevelts, the Schuylers. But when she ventured over to Brooklyn in 1802 to visit friends, Mr. Hezekiah Pierpont married her forthwith, and she became the mistress of his magnificent mansion on his vast estate. Uh, I love this, uh, this bust. Uh, this is, uh, picture is taken from uh, the Constab uh, Constable Hall's uh, library. And uh, you can see the, uh, the, and the look in her face. That's, that's a woman who, uh, she had 13 children, and uh, Hezekiah was off on business a lot, and she had no problem uh, sleeping with pistols under her pillow to make sure everything stayed in order. This was the, uh, the mansion that uh, was just mentioned in that article. This is on Brooklyn Heights. Uh, this mansion doesn't exist anymore, but Brooklyn Heights was really the center of Hezekiah's uh, uh, operation. But Hezekiah is important to our story in that he made many, many, many visits, uh, annual visits to the North Country. Uh, he inherited the land uh, through his wife, uh, William Constable, when he died, uh, uh, gave land to uh, Anna. Uh, that passed uh, then into the Pierpont holdings, and Hezekiah, uh, falling in love with the North Country from his many visits, continued to purchase uh, land out of the Constable estate. And he got to be uh, about 500,000 acres, so he might very well be the, uh, one of the largest single landowners of the North Country. Um, but he split his business. He was half of his business was in Brooklyn, uh, developing uh, uh, really the, the city of Brooklyn Heights at the time, and uh, also developing the land up in the North Country. To that end, he sent his, uh, Hezekiah sent his uh, eldest son, who was named William Constable Pierpont, uh, to the North Country to begin managing the lands and developing the lands. Uh, so William uh, Constable Pierpont came north uh, when he was still a teenager, I think about 19, and I've marked here on the map the, the Pierpont, uh, the approximate location of the Pierpont lands that 
that William would have been developing. So uh, William settled here full time. He did go back to visit uh, in Brooklyn, but he always lived in the North Country from uh, his initial visit on. Uh, he's left us some uh, good diaries that can uh, you can follow the, the adventures of him uh, setting up uh, in uh, developing the land and building his own little mansion, which is called Pierpont Manor. Now the village that uh, he showed up in, William showed up in, was called uh, Bears Creek, but it was renamed at, at some point as Pierpont Manor. So the little village of Pierpont Manor, as it exists now, is where you will find the current Pierpont Manor, which is our upper left. This is an older picture of it. Uh, it looks approximately like that today. If you drive through the, uh, the village, uh, his land office is uh, below here in the lower left. That building also still exists. It's a small building uh, in the front yard of the, of the mansion. Directly across the road is the, uh, the Zion Church that William Constable Pierpont built. Uh, he lost a son and he built that church in uh, memorial of losing a son. Uh, so the, the Pierpont Manor stayed in the Pierpont family for about a generation and a half. It then passed into other private ownership. Uh, it still exists. Uh, it is uh, not a place you can visit. It's not a museum. Uh, but if you're ever going up and down uh, uh, Interstate 81, um, it's, uh, you can take the stop and drive through the little village of Pierpont Manor. There was one other son that was involved, of uh, Hezekiah and Anna Constable, and that was Henry Evelyn. But he primarily stayed in Brooklyn. Uh, he, he oversaw the ferry and the development of the Brooklyn lands. And he's probably most famous for the Greenwood Cemetery. It was the a cemetery he developed on Brooklyn. Uh, the, the Pierpont uh, Mausoleum is uh, in the lower right. Uh, the Greenwood Cemetery is uh, currently a very famous, world famous cemetery, a tourist attraction, has its own large website and, and following. It was part of the rural cemetery movement of the time. But uh, for our purposes, Henry was a substantial landowner up in the North Country. He owned down, uh, kind of marked here, uh, near the Osceola era, uh, area, uh, and also extensive land holdings up on the St. Lawrence, which is really outside the scope of the Black River Valley. And he was also uh, someone who did not take an active role up here, so we, we're going to skip over him now. But it's worth noting that he was a large landowner in the North Country. At this point, we're going to uh, now talk about the third, uh, and actually return to the third family of developers, and that would be William Constable Jr. As uh, I've already mentioned, William Constable Sr., his father, the one who purchased Macomb, um, Macomb's purchase and uh, absorbed most of it from his partners. Uh, he, he died fairly young and his uh, eldest son, William Jr., was still a teenager in college when he died. So, so he inherited some land, but he was not active until a few years after that. Uh, he graduated from college, he got married, he married into the McVicker family, a, a prominent New York City, rich New York City family. He visited the North Country and he decided to move there and to build Constable Hall there and to manage land there. So he moved up uh, to the North Country in, in 1810. Uh, unfortunately, he also died young at age 35, shortly after building Constable Hall, and he left a widow and five children uh, behind him. This, uh, he actually inherited a rather modest amount of land uh, in comparison to his uh, uh, brother-in-law, Hezekiah Pierpont. He inherited about 10 or 20,000 acres in what was called the town of Turn at that time. It's now uh, Constableville, the, the village of Turn, that location uh, here. Uh, there had been a land agent in place uh, named Nathaniel Shaler a few years before that. Uh, his father had appointed him and was busy selling land. So by the time William Jr. arrived to build Constable Hall in 1810, uh, it had been settled for 14 years and you would have had uh, probably about 20 people living in Constableville. You would have had the grist mill operating, the saw mill operating, and of course the tavern would have been operating. That was uh, uh, the, usually the third building that was built in any little village. Uh, it was known uh, as the Hotel Parquet uh, late, in later years. So uh, a little pop-up question. Um, despite the hopes of many of these uh, uh, people, uh, developers, the purchasers, 
uh, cities did not really develop in the North Country, except for Watertown, of course. Uh, Constableville had a head start of 20 years on Rochester. It took Rochester 20 years to catch up. Same with uh, Buffalo, um, uh, Cleveland, all of those cities uh, were way behind Constableville for quite a stretch of time. Uh, and everybody was expecting cities to develop up in the North Country. So they didn't. Any thoughts? I see snow. Transportation, remote location. Winter comes up again, lack of funding for canals. Uh, all good reasons. Uh, I continue to think about it. There's no one reason, but I, I would say the, the very first and short term was the Erie Canal opened up. And uh, it, that enabled a flood of people and goods uh, down you know, the stretch from Albany all the way to Buffalo, into the lakes and so on. Uh, and that really changed the dynamic of the North Country immediately when it, ha when it happened. Uh, so yes, it, that did cause the North Country to become bypassed to a certain extent. And also, as I've already mentioned, depressed the land values up here. I think, uh, I think after you've been up here for a little while and I realize the climate is not, maybe not as uh, um, uh, mild as uh, maybe one thought, that also retarded uh, uh, growth. And um, I, I would say in the longer term, uh, there was not a lot of wealth coming out of the, the natural resources except for uh, timber, uh, paper products, obviously dairy, you know, all to this day. Uh, but there were no uh, uh, iron deposits found, et cetera. So the, the economic base was, was there, but it was not great. And so, um, but it's something to think about. But William Constable uh, did accomplish building Constable Hall before he passed. And uh, here's a, a contemporary picture of it. Uh, we like to call it the Jewel of the North Country. It's a pleasing uh, federal style symmetry, uh, uh, delights the eye of, of every decade, uh, every generation. It really is a beautiful building. Uh, five, uh, five generations of constables live there. It's actually unusual for house museums uh, to have the founding a family lived there for such a long period of time. Uh, so that's a, one of the unique aspects of Constable Hall. But another unique aspect uh, is that uh, when you come to visit, you'll, you'll be surprised and pleased to see how many artifacts, uh, original artifacts you will find uh, at the hall. We already touched on Anna Constable's bust. Uh, the little table here in the lower right connects with our story. Um, when Hezekiah Pierpont was in Paris during the revolution, um, the Queen of France was Marie Antoinette, and uh, she uh, ended up being uh, executed, and all of her possessions were sold at auction. Uh, Hezekiah went to that auction and bought this little sewing table and uh, brought it uh, back to uh, New York. So you'll see that in the drawing room of Constable Hall. Now, Constable Hall, I, I'm not going to uh, talk about it really much more uh, because we have a three-part webinar going on. It's called the Constable Chronicles. Uh, the next uh, session will be October 28th at 7 p.m. Uh, you can get the registration links off of the Tug Hill website or Constable Hall website or the Constable Hall a Facebook page. Uh, but I do want to emphasize it's, it's very much worth the visit. The, um, we have uh, wonderful grounds to wander around on. Uh, the yellow building, there's the servants quarters uh, that we're improving the interpretation of. There was an active farm uh, that was part of the Constable Hall estate. That's now uh, not part of the uh, current Constable Hall. That's actually privately owned, but the barn is still there. And, uh, and the place is very well uh, renowned for the beautiful gardens that are there all summer long. One of the oldest uh, continuously gardened gardens in the nation. Uh, and uh, uh, Dr. LeRae mentioned uh, land office. I mentioned land office. The land office for the constables was actually within Constable Hall and it's one of the rooms. So when you come to visit, we will show you the, the safe and the unique uh, fireproofing method that they used in that land office. Um, with that, I'm kind of reached the end of my presentation, but I just want to touch on uh, a little bit of what came next. Uh, after that initial generation of, uh, uh, that uh, turned, uh, uh, started the first farms. 
The first wave was from New England, as I mentioned. The subsequent waves of immigrants were from Europe and variously from Ireland, France, Germany, Wales, uh, then Eastern Europe, Poland, and Hungary. And the villages slowly formed and clustered around the farmlands and uh, the timber and uh, paper product industries. Uh, so the, the villages then formed as, uh, as this part of the support network. Uh, the, uh, the new immigrants typically would, would take up the task of farming the area. And the Black River then evolved uh, from, uh, with roads, canals, railroads to move the products and peoples. So all through that whole process uh, during the 1800s, uh, Black River was central and was the artery of the region. Uh, in just a couple of illustrations that uh, there, there was uh, an industrial base at, at Watertown and uh, well, why? Because there were many falls. So it was uh, power. Power was uh, extracted from the falls to bootstrap the, uh, the industrial uh, process. Carthage, uh, they had the Long Falls. Uh, that was actually first founded uh, in 1798 with uh, people going up, up and down the river. And uh, the third example would be High Falls, or now we call it um, Lions Falls. Uh, had a, a paper mill, again, tapping the power of the falls. So the river was central to the uh, um, uh, generating the power to bootstrap up uh, the industry. At that point, uh, I'm, I've kind of come to my end, uh, you know, th throw out one more, uh, one more question. Um, were there any lasting impacts left by the developer generation or is this just a quaint story that we uh, can uh, uh, kind of revisit once in a while? Uh, or, or were there lasting impacts? Um, so that's kind of a question that I, that I have. At this point, I, I, I'm at the end of my presentation. I'm happy to take uh, the questions. Um, and uh, I'll kind of turn it over to Jennifer or Dr. Rush if they have any final comments. And um, um, I will give my answer of uh, what the lasting impact was after I see a few more, uh, a few more answers. So back uh, about four o'clock, Mr. Uh, I'm sorry, Calvin Campany has the question. I, I believe it's addressed to Dr. Rush. Um, has there been any other, other locations in the North Country where prehistoric artifacts have been found? Oh, uh, you're, you're muted. There you go. Sorry about that. Um, and the answer is absolutely yes. Uh, because of uh, the tremendous amount of, of military activity, Fort Drum is without a doubt the most intensively surveyed uh, piece of land in our region when it comes to archaeology. But um, no, we are one of the most important um, areas of, of uh, prehistoric occupation, perhaps even in, in all of Northeastern North America. And uh, we have a whole series of Haudenosaunee village sites uh, that a uh, date to the uh, 15th and uh, early 16th centuries, 14, 1500s. There's a cluster at the head of French Creek uh, near Clayton. There's a cluster um, in the vicinity of Dry Hill, although sadly most of those have been destroyed by development and, and uh, mining. Um, and then we have another cluster in Rutland Hollow, and those are our uh, established village sites with remains of longhouses. Um, Point Peninsula, is uh, probably for all intents and purposes a giant archaeological site. There's burial mounds out there. There's a, a carrying place uh, where uh, you could bring your canoes uh, up over the isthmus to get into Shimo Bay. Um, so really, uh, Lewis County, I think there's many more sites that have yet to be discovered. Probably the farmers know um, uh, of Lewis County and know way more about what might be out there than I do. But um, yeah, the, the, we've had people living here in our region for at least 13,500 years. And they've left behind uh, their student tools and various other, their fireplaces uh, and evidence of their activities here. Lots of fishing sites along the lake and uh, the Black River. Um, our uh, bluffs on Fort Drum uh, above the Black River are pretty much a continuous uh, prehistoric occupation. One, a nice long archaeological site, as is the alluvial floodplain, and, and yes, uh, way way beyond. Okay, thank you. 
You can see some of the questions or the uh, answers to Peter's questions. Um, uh, town village names, uh, hydroelectric, hydro modification, infrastructure. Few. I'll, I'll give my my answer to that to what was one of their most lasting impacts. There are probably several answers, but the one that I that I come back to is that when you I think it's well attested when you read about what the developers were doing uh, when they were trying to attract people to come to live here. They were interested in a good quality of settler. It was not an easy job to come and set up, uh, set up farms here. So they really recruited uh, very consciously a, a, a quality of people. And uh, what was that quality? They had to be hardworking. They had to be honest. They had to be straightforward. Uh, and I think I think that's still, uh, I think that's still true of North Country people. That's the way I think of them. Uh, they, they're they're good people, and, and I like to think that it, it started out that way. And uh, we'll give the uh, the developers a, a little bit of a hat tip. Maybe they helped get the ball going in in that direction. Any other questions or comments? Where's my chat window? All right. Well, if there's nothing else, I took the opportunity there to sort of um, plug the remaining uh, Black River Watershed webinars. I'd like to thank our speakers for that um, fascinating and informative uh, look at the history and um, the indigenous peoples and of uh, the three families. Uh, like Katie had mentioned, there's also, there's sounds like there's another musical brewing here with all the uh, different historical names in the North Country. So I appreciate all your time. I appreciate your efforts and I'm looking forward to uh, hearing more another time. Hopefully we'll get to to hear from you both again. Thank you so much. And thanks to everybody joining us. Thank you. It's been a privilege. It's been fun. <laughs> All righty. I'm just looking at the chat before I stop the, the presentation. So thank you. Got a lot of thanks. Um, okay. Yep. All right, everybody. Thank you very much, and we'll see you next time. Thanks.